year we do have a district wide focus on increasing use of technology specifically as curriculum um, and in curriculum and instruction in teaching and in learning we're kicking off our as you know our um, week-long professional development institute with a Q um, teacher rock star which is all about using technology for project-based learning And the other half of the instruction had is, of course, regarding the curriculum, the tools that teachers use to um, address the standards in the classroom and have students learn them. So one of the big successes we've had this year, we've talked about it quite a bit at our board meetings, is we have a California State Standards-Based Math Program, math, and everything that comes along with that, all of the highs and lows that come with it. But it's happening in every school, and it's, it's had a success. Um, we've also had, like they discussed, the SNAP Learning Close Reading Program. We are looking ahead at adopting a language arts curriculum, um, a language arts adoption for the upcoming year. And so we have some, some grade levels and some schools that are anxious and ready to pilot those couple of programs and to give us their input about what they think about those things and then give teachers the chance to, to select that. And we also have, of course, a very passionate, excited group about learning the units of study process, regardless of what the tool is, regardless of what the adoption is an opportunity to take those tools and make them our own so that we're using them in a way that's appropriate for our students and for ourselves too. And so of course that's the challenge as well, to make sure that we have that in every classroom. And suggested changes, we've had a lot of discussions about math and about language arts and science. We need to integrate that more into what we're doing. And I think that the summer school program is a fantastic step in that direction. We also have a really dedicated group of uh, teachers and principals this year who are attending a, a, a summit at the county office, and they've been doing that consistently, talking about the changes in the next generation science standards and trying to make some changes in our district and our county, so we're excited about that. And of course, we need more supplemental materials for Spanish language arts, for teaching of Spanish in our dual language programs. Another important part of our goal one in student achievement and making sure that we provide interventions to the students who need them. And so we have had a lot of success with our um, implementation level and the number of students that are involved in um, interventions, making sure that those who need it are actually receiving the ser um, services. We do have some preliminary data from some of the programs to show um, that our students are making progress not only within the um, assessments that are in the program but it's carrying over and we see things in fluency um, so that the students can comprehension. We do have a sub summer map uh, intervention program scheduled. Um, a challenge right now we have um, limited Spanish language arts interventions. Only one that's been identified and is, is in use for um, kinder and first grade and suggesting a, a change we really need to prioritize identified a district-wide math intervention program for the coming year. Um, we're going to turn our eyes now to our English learner population and again this is one of the required metrics. So one of, as Mary, um, as um, Lori, Lori said and um, Sanders, um, one of our required metrics from the state is actually the self test which is a California English language development test for our English learners. Um, this year, 61% um, uh, of the students uh, will increase one level of English proficiency as measured by um, the self. That was actually the goal. So as you can see here, this is taken from, and that is actually the AMA01. Um, exact. The state actually um, percentage was 62%. That was at the state. Um, Selena City is to the right of that, which is the 49.9%. So out of the 4,072 students that actually took the test, only 2,032 students actually were able to move one level forward, okay? So um, if a student stays on the same level, it's not counted. And obviously if they regress, it's not counted. So this is actually moving from one self overall level to the next, so that, that's the states. Um, yes. The self is administered in the fall of my grade. It is. Um, so, so there would be, if I understand it correctly, there would be a drought in the summer as far as uh, learning, as far as learning, especially if the child is not 
attending summer school, having any type of instruction. Yes. It, it would seem to me that it would reflect, and the cell would reflect that drought that's there. And um, has there been any um, idea of administering <coughs> at the end of the I'm glad you asked that. Actually, there is. There's a new test coming out. It's called the LPAC. It's going to take over the cell. English language, I don't remember. I don't know. It's so new. Um, uh, I don't know all of it, but I can bring that to you all in the future. And I can add it to my acronym. I think it might be my acronym book, actually, or my pronoun. But um, so what that's going to do, it's going to change when we're actually administering the cell. So for initials, it will stay the same in the fall or the first 30 days that they actually enroll into a school, and if they haven't been selected before within that um, year. But the actual annuals um, are going to actually be in the spring, so which actually addresses that. That's one of the, the one of our concerns. The other concern also is our students who are actually redesignated. Um, we re we normally when they actually uh, meet the requirement for redesignation, which is early advanced. Um, overall, and they can't be um, inter, uh, is it intermediate in any of the other sub uh, domains, then we, um, and, and meeting all of the other qualifications, we redesignate them. So guess what that happens? They, that pulls them away from our pot of actually showing them the increase for them too for the following year. Okay? And I, I don't know if, um, if there's any other. Okay? So that, those are other factors to take in consideration just for that one year of move. Okay? Um, so then I'm going to move on to the next one, which is um, our students that are more than five years or less than five years enrolled in our U.S. schools. So um, once again, this is a metric that is actually, that the state actually expects us to have here on our, in, in, in our um, LCAP. So 32% of L EL students who have received less than five years of English instruction will attain English proficiency um, on, on CELT. And then 51% of EL students who have received five years or more of English um, <coughs> instruction will attain English proficiency on the CEPT. So this is actually equivalent to our MAO2. So once again, um, I'm just showing you, I actually pointed out, like I did on the top, just our latest, uh, 1516, but you can actually, I have two pri uh, previous years here so you could see um, uh, what our, our scores have been. So now with the less than five years, here's 2015-16, this is our five years or more, so um, this is actually at 52, this was a state goal, 52.8, um, and we had ours at 32.9. So out of the 859 students who met this criteria of being five years or more, um, 283 were, um, actually met that goal. And then for our less than five years, the goal was 25.5, and the students who actually um, met that goal was 15.3%, um, only 600 and. Um, and I think actually that denominator is actually um, incorrect there because that's mm -hmm. our less than five years. I'm noticing that that's from the company, so I'll, I'll have I mean I'll make sure to have that um, fixed. Okay, or maybe not. Actually, no, because those are less than five years. That's actually a lar our larger poll. Um, so I apologize for that. But um, one of the things I actually would like to point out that are also um, caveats to this, or keep in mind, is that um, how a student is actually um, classified as either being less than five years or more than five years is their um, enrollment um, into a U.S. school. So they take that, the, e, the entrance into a U.S. school, so that could have been back in kindergarten, and then they take their latest self. So for our more than five years, it could have been our students that are in fourth grade. So they take the year that they entered in kinder in any U.S. school, not just in Salina City, and then they actually uh, compare that to the, the self. So um, one thing that the state's not looking is it's always been one of my um, uh, things that I, a factor I think is very important to look at is that they're not checking at the students that we are being uh, accounted, uh, accountable for is that if they're continuously enrolled. So it doesn't have that word in there. It, all they're looking at is into a U.S. school and then the latest set. Mm -hmm. Okay, so those are kind of things to kind of take in mind too. Yes. So, you know, 20 percentage points between what the state, uh, what the state averages and what we are as a district is pretty significant. Uh, is that a reflection of our programs, or is that a reflection of our popula you know, our our population, or our our environment, or have we do we do we know? I mean, do we know why? Or I think it's a um, it, it's a combination. Uh, and I, Mary, please, um, if you'd like to, it's the goal. 
Oh, it's the goal. It's the state goal. Mm -hmm. Oh, the so state goal. The oh. goal. Right, and then, I mean, I'm just correct, but it's oh, okay, yeah. So why is our goal so much less? That's what's our average. That's our average. Oh, that's, that's our, our average. average. Oh, oh, there's is the oh goal. okay, I'm sorry. Yeah. I got confused. Okay, so, <laughs> so yes, okay. So, okay, let me rephrase that. If that's the state goal and we're 20% off, what are we not, what, what's not happening? What are we not doing to meet the needs of these children? I mean, I, do we know or? Well, we can skip forward two slides. Just okay. Yeah. Um, and there that, is a. Sorry, that last one was significant. It, yeah, that's fine. true. It's on the redesignation. You want to talk about so, that before first? So the last um, metric that I will be addressing this evening is the redesignation. That's also a metric that um, the state requires us to um, report on. And so the goal is 1% increase in percent of students meeting redesignation criteria and being redesignated. So I have a two-year year. So for example, two, uh, for 2014-15, our enrollment of 91, uh, 25, um, actually 271 students were actually redesignated, which was a 2.97. This year, for 2015-16, uh, um, our enrollment is 91 over September, we're 20 less. Um, we had 582 students, so we're at 6%. So we actually um, exceeded yeah. that 1% increase. Okay. And those kids don't factor into the, uh, is that correct? Every year they come out, so they, they, so they are not in that. Yeah. Oh, okay, okay, that was one of my, yeah. Okay, so well then, I, I get it, I get it. But we do have some suggestions and some changes. So I want to uh, reintroduce to you Claudia Morales, who is our program manager specifically for English learner programs and support. And that is one of the changes we've made because we have to have a fine focus on this group of students and moving forward. And so we're very fortunate and lucky to have the talented Ms. Morales. <laughs> Who's been waiting all night. <laughs> yes. <laughs> So, um, so I'm just going to start with the successes as well. Um, at the beginning of the school year, we went, our district went through a pro, uh, federal program review. Um, under these actions, the reviewers discovered no findings, um, meaning that the programs and supports for English learners that we had in, had in place um, met or exceeded standards. Uh, this June, Oh, I'm sorry, um, the Salina City School District has two certified blood trainers um, on board that are continuing the, continuing, sorry, I'm trying to, it's late. Yeah, <laughs> continually supporting and training our teachers. Also, uh, this coming June, we will be um, providing training to all the teachers on understanding the ling English language arts and English language development framework, or the, the standard. Um, this is the full school, school year, uh, first uh, school year, again, like um, uh, Ms. Sanders said, that the position of program manager, um, uh, specifically to support bilingual programs, um, was, or, you know, was established. Um, I was hired for that position. Um, and among the responsibilities of the program manager, um, and that position is to support the teachers in alternate programs such as dual immersion or the transitional bilingual programs. One of the ways that um, these teacher, some, one of the ways that uh, support was given to the teachers was um, all day collaboration. During these all day collaboration days, the teachers got to dialogue, uh, they got to um, share data, um, and also um, visit classrooms and share best practices. Um, another success um, that was impacted by the program manager position for English learners at bilingual programs is the streamlining of the dual immersion um, enrollment process. Like uh, Mr. Zimmerman was explaining earlier, um, there because um, there is such um, a, um, a, a, a an interest, a high interest in a program like dual immersion, and enrollment is ever increasing. So we created that application process. Um, and for all any uh, person, all the person, people interested in either uh, enrolling their children in TK or kindergarten or even first grade, um, and like again, like it was stated earlier, um, the criteria to approve the um, applications again is giving giving priority to the students who attend who are belong to the attendance area of the school, children who ha currently have siblings in the program. Um, children uh, 
who are um, whose parents are employees of the district, and then of course we're going to have a lottery for any of the um, waiver uh, transfers transfers that um, we receive. The um, the information on the applications, um, the information regarding the application process and regarding um, and dual merger programs was done via informational meetings that we that we conducted. Um, and then, um, and also the criteria that we are using to enroll the students, it, a lot of it really is, goes back to the criteria that is used by HR to um, enroll students that are um, requesting those transfers. So by streamlining the process of this enroll, of the enrollment, um, we've supported the site administration and their administrative staff in organizing this huge component of the <coughs> program. So I'm gonna move to the challenges. Uh, the single challenge has been acquiring English language development materials for our students. Um, our current English language arts program has um, a limited ELD component. Uh, so we're currently collecting some of our existing supp supplemental English language development materials and um, make, making them available for our teachers. And it is our hope that with the new adoption, we can also gain a solid ELD program. Okay. Next, we have s some uh, changes. So um, the, with the new adoption, we will have, uh, the new adoptions will be offering lessons for both integrated and designated ELD. So one of our big, um, uh, well, our big responsibilities is um, to fully understand the difference between integrated ELD and designated ELD. So the way it's defined now is integrated happens when the teachers who have English learners in their classrooms use the California English um, Language Development Standards in tandem with the California um, State Standards or Comical State, State, State Standards for English Language Arts and for Literacy and other content areas. Designated ELD, of course, is the protected time during the regular school day in which the teachers use the California English Language Development Standards as the focus or the focal standards in ways to build to, into and from content instruction in order to develop um, critical language, critical English language needed to understand content. Um, and then at last, um, yes. Uh -huh. So in our dual language immersion, Program. Which, which of the two are they both used in our dual language programs? Right now, uh, yes. Except um, our dual immersion does what we call um, English um, English language um, academic English language time. So some of the same strategies are used throughout the day uh, during English time, and then during that, I also development of English language arts and um, literacy. And so the teachers have to follow follow the standards. So maybe my, my question is make it clear. Mm -hmm. There's an English language arts component and an English language development component. Yes, that's correct. We separate the two or we were actually combining them? Or where are we? For our dual program? Or um, the general. For our, let's say for English language learners. For English language learners, anybody? Well, so, it's it's both. So integrated is um, throughout the day in different areas. So some of the strategies to help make uh, content comprehensible are used during math, during science, during social studies, and then the the designated time is that. ELD time, that, that um, uninterrupted time that's given to really strictly focus on kind of the way English works so that kids have the language to be able to understand content better. So it, it is a combination of both. Uh, and then finally, uh, we are uh, partnering up with Ms. Laura Cortez the English Language Arts and English Language Development Coordinator and Administrator at MCOE. She will be conducting the professional development that we have planned for June, and she will also be coming back. Um, I'm, I'm sorry, she's going to be specifically working with us on understanding that English Language Arts slash English Language Development Framework. 
and um, she'll be coming back to do follow up, um, you know, uh, follow up training for our teachers throughout this, the next school year. So that was a lot, um, and that is just again kind of as an orientation to um, what's been going on and the direction that we know we need to be putting into place for next year. Questions? No? Yes. Mm -hmm. I think uh, it might be more intelligent or intelligible for us. Uh, the state goal is 52.8 and we're 32.9. Well, how about the rest of the districts of our size, our ethnic make makeup? How how close are they to state goal? I mean, that, that makes nothing, no sense at all. Uh, we might be far and above everybody else in our same situation. We don't know yet. I mean, we just need that other information. I will say something about, I, I think you're referring to um, the actual, the, the self data? Yes. Right? Mm -hmm. The self, right. Yeah, yeah. the redesignation data. Yeah. Um, those those two data points right there are um, our AMAO information, which we have not met. Um, and I think they were, they took me a bet. You know, they, they need to step back because Consistently, the district has not made their MAO1. MAO1 is pretty easy to make, and you should be making it. And so um, there's lots of questions. I think Amy started to ask the right questions around that. Um, MAO2, which really begins to determine if the English learners are going to be long-term ELs. We don't want any of our sixth graders who have been with us since kindergarten to go to middle school and be classified an English learner. They'll, they will fall into a tracking system. And their, their high school, their, their abilities to meet their A through G requirements in high school are going to be extremely limited. So I'm very concerned about this data point. I'm concerned that we, um, a district who have high numbers of English learners, are not, um, it looks, I mean, at least the promising piece is the redesignation piece of data, but um, why this hasn't been met and why this hasn't been met over time is a question I think that we really need to look at. I, I do want to say on the last slide, um, you are looking at some promising programs. Um, I think the rule of three is being used at a couple of the schools, and I don't know, you know, it's, it's a, a program that might yield some results. I think we still have to look at the data behind that. But not having a consistent, coherent ELD program, um, I'm not even sure that there was designated EL time um, for our English learners across the district. I think there's lots of reasons why these, you know, these stats are as they are. And they've been consistently low over time. And this is what we are held accountable for in our supplemental concentration um, LCAP dollars. We're funded um, extra money um, for these children and we are held responsible for the um, progress, academic progress of these students. So um, I certainly will be asking questions more and more so. Um, I, I don't look um, for a program necessarily to solve that problem. We have a new English language arts slash ELD adoption. Um, we had that for 10 years. We've had programs that had the ELD component on that. I don't know what the implementation of that really truly looked like. I think it's kind of, you know, um, it varies from school to school. And um, I think, you know, to continue to ask these questions around the progress of English learners is um, we will be held accountable in years to come um, because we're being funded on a model that looks specifically at these students. So um, I just continue to look at some promising practices that are, that are emerging. Um, we're looking at, um, I think last time somebody asked a question, and I can't remember who it was when we did the uh, dual immersion um, presentation around having a data point, around looking at assessments. When we were at Cobby, I was sending Claudia Gold get that Spanish assessment. We need the data. We need, we need data. Um, I think, Virginia, you pointed out in one of your slides that we didn't have 
um, the assessment data for ELD. We're not doing the progress monitoring and those data points in between to measure whether those are happening. We're looking at a one-year snapshot here, and um, that's not enough. And so, um, I'm sorry, I don't want to put a damper on this, but I think that this particular goal in our LCAP is one that we really need to continually um, get updates around and measure and begin to really look at what happens at collaboration times for teachers in terms of looking at data and how that being monitored and what, what assessments are we really helping teachers to actually understand what the needs are for those students. So lots of work to be done, a lot. So again, with the ELD has new standards, you've got a new assessment coming up for them. Uh, for English learners, there's going to be lots of changes and a lot of professional development that needs to happen around that. And that's the good part, right? You're, you're collaborating and you're looking forward to providing that professional development. I think Oscar has, um, you want to come up to the front? One comment. Hi, Oscar, I'm not sure we, we have tons of ELD students at Sherwood. Now, early we were discussing dual immersion, and what is dual immersion? Um, what does it rely on? Remod it relies on student models that can speak the language. Well, I, I know there's a whole compliance thing, but take Sherwood, for instance. What we're doing for ELD, trying to help, is what happens to our students is we have to level. So what are we doing? We're leveling all the kids that can't speak the language, and they're together. Well, and we take all their models away and we put them all in one room. It's ineffective, it doesn't work. Whereas, when we use, they're all together in the same room, the models, the ones that are learning, using glass strategies, that's more sort of like a DI. So that's one problem why it's harder for us to meet this goal, because we're secluding the ones that need to learn the language from the ones that know the language. So that's just, an observation and you know we can not level that would be great you know so I think I, I, if I'm understanding you Oscar uh, that the leveling happens for a designated time which is usually a half an hour to 45 minutes depending a day. on the grade mm -hmm. yeah but every day every day the yeah. so the designated uh, the that's designated ELD time and I think as was asked around the integration so both of those methodologies or pedagogical approaches are being used. I just say whatever we've been using over time has not been working. It's not working in um, the time that we should be redesignating our students. We don't have the rates. If somebody asked, was it Oscar wanted to see the comparisons to other districts that look like us? That's a good comparison to, to note. And I would say many districts that look like us have much higher scores than this. So, a concern. Is, is there the, the possibility that, say, you know, some teachers at Sherwood could try not leveling for a year and see what happens to their scores? I mean, is there, is there the option that, um, that that might be one of those leaps of faith that we try just to see if, if it improves because obviously you've been leveling for years and years and it's not working. I, I can guarantee you there will be plenty of teachers with a volunteer pilot something like that and compare scores with those that do level. I would be one of those. I mean, I don't know if this do is you guys want to speak to that because there, there are state some mandate. state and federal laws well, That's about what I was wondering. Yeah. Is there a state <laughs> mandate? Do you want to talk about that? <laughs> Yeah, and that there, there's a place for both of this, and that's why we don't have, we have what's called an SEI classroom, which is a heterogeneous classroom for the vast majority of the day where the levels are mixed. And during that time is when we have integrated ELD, when you talk about the BLAD strategies, where you're teaching math to a, a heterogeneous group, but in addition to having a a math content goal, you have a language goal. So that, you know, students are going to work in collaborative groups and have a discussion about, you know, mathematical practices. But then, at the same time, students at various levels of um, language development have specific 
targeted needs. Um, and so that's when you get into the leveling. I think one of the things that we really need to do is to take, again, looking at the programs that are in, that are being used for leveling, looking at the instruction that's happening during that leveling, and um, monitoring the progress of students in English language development. We really do not have a tool right now that we have something that's essentially a teacher judgment checklist of what students are able to do. And it isn't something that is um, evidence-based. Um, it's, it's not enough and it's not working. Uh, excuse me, uh, it's almost 10.30. We have a bylaw that says that regular meetings will be done by 10.30 unless we have a vote. And we vote to continue this meeting to a time certain. So I have a motion to continue this meeting to 10.45 11 o'clock. How long are we going to be here? Bring the morning? <laughs> Do action. Yeah. Let's start action. Okay. I move that we extend the meeting to 11 o'clock. Second. Second. Okay. All in favor? Yeah. Aye. 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 All opposed? Okay. I'm sorry. Who's next? Francisco. Francisco. You know, if, you were, if we were to open <coughs> bilingual classes at Sherwood, you wouldn't have to level. You wouldn't have to level. You don't have the numbers for dual language immersion, but you have that bilingual education class alternative. It's just a matter of opening those classes or having parents solicit those classes. You're right, and um, actually this year, Sherwood has two alternative program, which is a traditional early exit bilingual classroom in kinder. Um, so that was, um, there had been um, what in this district we call AP alternative program classrooms at Sherwood for um, quite a few years. I know, Mary, do you know how long it's been? 95% Jewish language learner. Parents aren't requesting bilingual programs. Well, they are now. They, they are now. Um, I can't um, speak to the what occurred um, 10, 12, to 8 years ago, but I know that beginning last year, um, parents were requesting them. Um, we had received in May of last year enough uh, parent requests to establish one class and they continue to come in and so in during the summer by July um, when the school opened we had two classrooms so that is um, the offering that program at Sherwood School is um, happening once again Excuse me, what were you doing? Kindergarten? Kindergarten right now. And that's not longitudinal, followed up? Not, no, because they, they, it, 
No, um, they haven't had a, a bilingual program there in Virginia. You believed it was 15 years? No, it's like 12 years ago, 13 years ago, right? I think so. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Ms. Perez? Mm -hmm. Gabriela Perez? Um, I have two children myself that are trilingual, and what I observed with, when it came to language acquisition, what worked is the motivation that the other children do not speak your language. My children were thrown into German, and their motivation was so obvious. They wanted to socialize. They wanted to be with them, but they spoke German, and my kids didn't. And they had no schooling in German ever, and they dove headfirst into it just because they wanted to be part of the group. And that's exactly what happens in the dual immersion programs. You have people on both ends that are monolingual in one or the other. So they have to find a common ground to learn each other's languages to communicate. What, and that's exactly the reason why Sherwood is not a good scenario for dual immersion, because you don't have that grouping. And so in situations like that, and I have taught at both ends, I've taught at Mission Park and at Natividad, what I observed there too was, in the scenario of Natividad, the gain was made, not in the SEI program and not in the, in the um, alternative program either, uh, because they, ha they hear a teacher speaking English, and the teacher speaks hopefully a relatively elaborate English, but their um, language among each other for everybody is Spanish. So they will fall back on that, and then they go home and speak some more Spanish, and the motivation isn't the same as if you have a scenario like at Mission Park, where you have children coming in that speak Spanish, but you have a very vast <coughs> majority that speaks no Spanish or rudimentary Spanish, and they want to socialize, and they they dive head in first because they want to socialize with the other kids, and they learn it much faster. And so the the more we have a scenario where we have monocultures, the more difficult it will stay, most likely. Thank you very much. You know what, um, Francisco? I'm going to take control of this meeting. I think I think we need to finish what we started, and uh, I'd like to wrap this. Discussion. Fascinating as it is, let's wrap it up and we'll move on. That's it. Yeah. yeah. All right. You know, we're not going to solve that one tonight. <laughs> um, <clears throat> we are at our first action item. Uh, what, what's up? This is um. Oh, can I go ahead? Um, yes, yes. Okay, this is a resolution for signatures and the only um, reason this is on your um, agenda for action is that we've added Beatrice Chidas, our new assistant superintendent of human resources, and she um, was not on the last resolution for authorization of signatures. So this is um, an action item to um, approve the sound. So, Yes, ask me. Uh, it's a resolution, isn't it? Yeah, resolution. Okay. So do I have a motion to approve resolution number 2015 slash 16 12? So moved. Do I have a second? Second. Okay. Uh, roll call, please. Well, roll call. President Stephen Kim. Aye. Vice President Roberto Garcia. Yes. Um, our clerk, Foster Hoffman. Yes. Trustee Francisco Estrada. Yes. Trustee Amy Ish. Yes. Yes. All right. So now we're in the curriculum. C2. Me again. Um, I'm reading before, to you a, the um, educator effectiveness plan. There is a revision to it. One is really very minor. Um, the business office was notified of a $5 difference, but uh, one is much more substantial. In the original report, I had stated that the money could not be spent for class for <coughs> instructional aids, for, for paraprofessional 
And then I received clarification that there is one area of professional development and activity that even though it states in um, the paperwork that it's for uh, mentoring and coaching certificated staff and training certificated staff to support effective teaching and learning, it can be used for classified. It doesn't have to do with standards-based instruction, um, but it is effective strategies. So in this revision, I um, have earmarked $50,000 for paraprofessional professional development. The two changes were a five dollar change and a, and, a and a fifty thousand dollar change that was taken from um, certificated to, to share the wealth with our classified partners. Okay. Okay. That's a line with our goals. Yeah, the recommendation for the staff is to move the proposed plan for the education effective block grant. So motion. So move. Second, anyone? I'll second. We got a motion and a second. To approve the proposed plan for education, I'm sorry, educator effectiveness block grant. All in favor say aye. 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 All opposed? Okay, five aye. zero. Thank you for the second motion. Uh, we're on to D2, board policy 5031, this policy revised. Board members. Uh, like <laughs> <laughs> I almost said good morning. <laughs> oh, no. uh, this, this is our food service supervisor, Carlos Burden. He's uh, relatively new to the district, and I would tell you that he's been a great addition. We stand before you tonight to ask that you approve an update of board policy 5030. It was last updated in May of 2006, so it's way overdue. There have been significant changes to the Federal Child Nutrition Program, into the Healthy Hunger-Free Kids Act. Both of those put a lot of additional requirements on us as we serve breakfast, lunch, fresh fruit and vegetables, and evening meal. Uh, so our policy was really not compliant. The timing of this is perfect because a, the CDE, California Department of Education, um, auditor came to take a look at our food program and we would ask you to approve this tonight so we have it on file for that team. Uh, it incorporates all of the latest requirements. It's fully compliant. And I have to salute Carlos for taking this on, aggressively putting it together, pulling in all the new requirements, getting it proof, moving it back and forth through uh, other experts to make darn sure that it was comprehensive and correct. Do you have any questions? I have. I have a comment, or a, 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 actually, I guess it's just a comment, and it is not about the food service part. That looks great. It's on the physical activity part. Um, uh, it's page five of six, and there's a statement in there that says physical activity during the school day, including but not limited to recess, physical activity breaks, or physical education will not be withheld as punishment for any reason. Is this being monitored? Because, yeah, I mean, if this is our board policy, I believe teachers need to understand, or staff needs to understand, that you can't withhold recess or PE to finish work because you didn't do your homework, because you got in a fight with someone. I mean, I just, According to this policy, that's the way I'm reading it. Is okay. Yeah, so that's actually a, an applicable law that's been happening for the past couple of years. So the reason we're doing this policy is to make it clearer for parents and teachers on what we're supposed to be doing as of now. Uh, it's really the policy that we currently have is really about 32 pages. So I think. You can imagine someone trying to look for that information and gets lost in the transaction. So this purpose is to make it a little easier for both parents and our own personal teachers and principals and administrators to guide their operation to what it's supposed to be. And to answer your question, I would expect that it's not being complied with at all sites right now. Mm -hmm. We'll make it's sure that we get out any. with the approval. <laughs> Okay, so, so recess with but us. it will be made very clear that this is now board policy. So, 
so it needs to and happen. Law. And law. And law. Okay. Can you cite where that is? Because as far as I can tell, that is not the law. The law says that a child will have recess for part of the day, but that part of it can be taken away from them. But it's a CDE, I can I cannot cite it right now. I could definitely uh, research it, but it was from the CDE website. It's under 33350. Okay. We'll send that to you. Thank you. Sure. And then we have Oh. <laughs> well, we had a, I had a couple of questions on a couple parts. I don't know if this is the one of the Carol. Thanks. Um, we had a couple of things. Um, I noticed and a couple of the others noticed that the, there's a district wellness committee, and it's it's supposed to be comprised of representatives of all school levels, including teachers. They might have asked me to find someone, or maybe I could even have done. I'm not sure, but I know we don't have a teacher on that. Um, but also, there's a lot about nutrition education um, and so forth that um, I'm, I'm not sure how much of this is new and how, and or not. So there's a lot of education, uh, part of health education classes, but also integrated into other classroom instruction through math, science. I don't know that any of that's happening. Teach media literacy with an emphasis on food and beverage marketing, um, include nutrition education for parents, teachers, and other staff. Um, some of those might be new, but I circled them because I wasn't quite sure. And if they are new, how is this going to happen? Um, was my question. Um, and then lastly, there was um, there's a thing about celebrations and rewards, and maybe this is uh, another law, but they can may only take place 10 minutes before the end of the school day. Um, and there's no way that I can, you know, have any. I mean, and we've really tried in our class to do healthy snacks, but even if if a parent brought um, carrot sticks and dip, I cannot hand it out and students eat it within 10 minutes. So I'm, you know, maybe this is law and so we're stuck with it, but I, I we're just not sure um, kind of what's going on. Sure. Thanks. Um, I'll, I'll talk very just briefly and then Carlos can chime in. Um, we don't see our time here. But it says, at the discretion of each school authority. So there's there's wiggle room there. The intent is to do it at the end of the day to not disrupt the instruction. In terms of is it going to be a cupcake or a carrot stick, I understand it totally. And I don't think everyone will always will ever be fully compliant because parents are going to bring cupcakes in. Well, we tell them not to, but <laughs> I have sent them home before. But it's the 10 minutes. So what is the... It says with the, discretion. So. But, yeah, so, but what does that mean to me as a teacher? Do I need to go to my principal and say, Johnny's mom wants to bring carrot sticks and dip, so can I have more than 10 minutes? I mean, this is very, this does not make it easier for, easy for teachers to um, to work around. <coughs> yeah. and, but I don't know, maybe there's, this is boilerplate, that's what it, I, I'm not quite sure what, what that you're intent, getting into. The intent of that paragraph was uh, the recommendation from the food service department is to do it at the end of the, of the uh, 10 minutes before the school ends. Uh, that was our recommendation based on feedback that we got in our counseling. 